Hello everyone, and welcome back. In my last video, I talked about doing some R&D into RBD upresing, and that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. If you are unfamiliar with what upresing is, it is the concept of working with a horrifically low poly sim like this one, which is very fast to iterate and therefore control. The low res sim is then used to guide a high res sim to achieve a predictable high res result. This is not a golden bullet, which reduces the final sim time of the high res, but is intended to maximize your valuable hours as an artist. This project file is quite large, so we won't have time to cover all of it within the constraints of this video. Instead, we'll be focusing on the core concepts. These are the base fracture, the guide sim, secondary fracture, and most importantly, the upper system. I will also be covering the rendering setup in Solaris and Karma CPU, touching on topics such as subsets, efficient authoring of USD for heavier effects like this, and some shading and render setting notes. There isn't anything too complicated going on in that department, but enough useful information to help you tie a shot like this together yourself. We are about to go through the core techniques of how to get this effect up and running, but if you would still like to learn more or look at the other setups inside the hit file that we don't have time to cover in this video, the project file is available on Gumroad, link below. In a standard workflow, you would typically sim at the required resolution, evaluate the results and iterate. After all these sims, we still might not have the desired result. This quickly gets frustrating as the feedback loop takes around 42 minutes ago in this theoretical example. On top of this, our feedback loop is limited by how fast our or our studio's hardware can compute the data, which can be very slow at production quality. The upres approach instead focuses spending the bulk of our time iterating and then submitting a high-res sim with a lot more confidence that the movement will match what we desire. So if you've done RBD before, you'll be familiar with the commonly promoted workflow of simulating the proxy geometry and then transforming the high-res fracture pieces using the orientation and translation of the proxy points. You will be used to working with high-res chunks that look like this. In the upres method, we will then fracture the high-res pieces a second time and then reapply the transform from the proxy points. This is where things start getting trickier. The twice fractured chunks will then be simulated again and we will need to manipulate the active and animated attribute so that the pieces at the edges of our chunks gradually get activated as the sim progresses. The terrain is just a grid displaced with a texture map from Gaia. You can of course just use Houdini height fields if you want. I call out everything outside of camera frustum so I can maximize the resolution in camera. I use the rest, noise, rest technique and Voronoi fracture this planar geometry, doing the extrusion after it to avoid Houdini cooking a 3D fracture. These chunks then go into a for loop where I remesh the inside group and add some noise displacement. I lerp the points of the outside back onto their original position so I don't modify the terrain surface. I generate a mask with the same outside group and blur it a tiny bit, then use a lerp once again to a slightly smaller version of the chunk to get this tapered look. This fracturing method allows us to get nice displaced edges and inside faces, as well as a nice overhanging edge that will work nicely later when we will eat into it with the opera simulation. Now that we have our base fracture, we can set up the proxy sim. First, we need to create the proxy geometry of the pieces. I do this by looping over the pieces, shrink wrapping them and retrieving their name attribute from the incoming iteration of the loop. You can also use the convex decomposition node to do this, but I found I was getting better performance by manually building the loop. After this, I am using an assemble to pack the pieces and then deleting the pack prims with an add node in a separate stream so I can work with the points for building the activation and velocity impulse. If we swap to top orthographic and enable this mask attribute, we can see what is being used to drive the impulse. This is done using the simple wrangle. We can use the rel bbox function to get the relative bounding box of this geometry, using its x component inside a smooth function. By animating the first value in the smooth and adding a tiny amount to the second, we can create a really tight, animatable mask. If that made no sense to you, then this might. Anything below range bottom returns a zero, and anything above range top returns a one. Anything in between is a smooth interpolation from zero to one. If we shift the values around, it squeezes or loosens the values. Meaning, if range top is equal to range bottom plus something really small, we will get a super tight, basically non-existent easing between the two values. Next, I time shift this animation back one frame and compare its mask attribute to the current frame, allowing me to isolate and group whatever has just gained the mask attribute. I use this group to add some velocity onto those points only, while I use the mask to set the active attribute from 0 to 1. You may notice I have these border points around the edge that aren't being affected by the mask, and that is because I use the border of the terrain geo to group those points by distance and deactivate them. 
After this, you simply copy your attributes back over to your packed prims. You can use an add node again to validate if they copied correctly. Inside DOPS, you'll need a simple pop wrangle to update the attributes each frame. Just remember you want to set active and add to V. That is it for the proxy sim. I won't spend more time in it as you will want to build your shot differently. Just remember, you are going to spend the bulk of your time on the proxy sim in this workflow, so it's worth investing extra time into making this part of your node graph easy to use. So now we've cached the proxy sim out as points and it is working as intended, transforming the high-res pieces. In order to set up the up-res, we need to fracture the geometry a second time, but when we run our second sim, we will need a name attribute for those pieces to behave independently, yet we still need to retrieve the transforms of our proxy sim. This essentially means we need two name attributes. We can do this by renaming the name attribute of the proxy sim to something else on both the pieces and the points. I use xform name, but it can be whatever you want, as long as they both match up. Now that all the weird name attribute stuff is out of the way, I use a connectivity node to generate this chunk attribute, which will be essential later, so don't forget it. The up fracture itself is very simple. It is just the rest noise rest technique again, using points scattered on the outside group, which then pipe into another Voronoi. This time I didn't find a way around it. This fracture can get pretty slow depending on your incoming geometry. Let it cook and go get yourself a cup of coffee. After the up fracture is complete, make sure to validate it by checking it with the proxy points again to make sure the new pieces transform correctly with the new name attribute. In order to simulate this, we want to create proxy geo again, so we can just repeat the same shrink wrap loop trick. This time we retrieve name, xform name, and chunk. Cache that out and check your attributes are working as intended. Buckle up, because this is going to be theory heavy. First, we need to set ID for these pieces, as we will need this in a second. This wrangle is the cornerstone of the entire system. Let's have a look at it. So the idea behind the upres is that we calculate the distance between points of neighboring chunks, and if that passes a certain threshold, we will activate those pieces, else it will just follow the proxy sim animation. That means we need to find a way to measure the distance between pair IDs dynamically. If we grab a bunch of these pieces and move them over here, we can see the border pieces accumulate an attribute. So we have three beautiful chunks, 0, 1, and 2. We read this in at the top of the wrangle. We have the secondary fracture, so our pieces actually look like this. We will operate on just one piece for demonstration purpose. We use the near point function to open a point cloud, find all nearby points within a certain distance, and store them in an array. Next, we will loop through all items in the array. Remember, we want to find a pair ID on the neighbor chunk, not in our current one. We can do this by checking what chunk attribute the array point returns. If it is the same as our current point, we continue the loop. As soon as it finds a point on a different chunk, it registers that point as a pair ID and breaks a loop, discarding the rest of the items in the array. This means point 8 and point 36 are now paired together. This will of course repeat over all of the points in the geometry, so that all of them will pair up. This doesn't account for unique pairs only, as I didn't find it necessary for this shot, but you can program in that behaviour if needed. Now we can just read the position of the pair ID and compare that to the current position, and write that out as an attribute. This will measure the separation between the two. I use a time shift on frame 1 and then create a group based on the pair distance to hard set which points will be allowed to activate, as I don't want to eat too far into the chunk. So far, our pair distance has values greater than 0 at frame 1, which makes it annoying to control. I normalize this by subtracting the current pair distance by the time shifted pair distance. If we visualize this now, we can see the values start on 0 and then increase as the pieces move away from each other. I use the exact same time shift trick from the proxy sim, except I compare length and velocity this time. I will create an integer attribute, which I use to force some pieces to become active on their first frame for better impact. Now that we have all this, we can pipe it into a solver, which will dynamically control the active attribute. We are reading the current distance and setting a threshold. We want to compare the distance to the threshold, and if it's greater or less than that value, accumulate an attribute, which is controlled by this rate parameter multiplied by some random resistance. Once that accumulated value goes past a certain point, we simply set the active attribute to 1 and the animated attribute to 0. Prior to this, all pieces were set to only animate, meaning they follow the movement of the proxy sim. And that's it for the core elements needed for this system. In DOPS, we just read the active and animated attribute like we did with the proxy. Over in stage, we start by self-importing the RBD pieces. We will want to set the layer save path. It's important to do this as it will speed up the RBD procedural later. We also want to scroll down to the bottom of the import data tab and enable subset groups. This will convert our inside and outside group from the fracture into subsets for separate material assignments. Next up, we use the RBD procedural lop to correctly set up our RBD simulation for USD. We point to the prim here and read the points directly from disk. As pointed out by Hern and Yano, this is a lot more optimized when dealing with large amounts of data. We can also check that our subsets are working by making a couple of flat shaders and applying them to test them out. Finally, we want to cache this to disk so we can sublayer it back in later. Thank you, lazy cinephile, for this tip.
I do need to mention there is a bit of fiddling around to get the RBD procedural lock to work. I created an entire video dedicated to this, so if it gives you any grief, make sure to check it out. Link below. We didn't cover the debris simulation in this video, but I instanced my prims directly onto the points from SOPS and then cached them out, as well as importing the terrain and converting it to USD. Now we can read all our layers back in. We can use the Houdini preview procedural node to visualize the procedural. If you leave it off, the RBDs won't move in the viewport, but it is great for performance. On the right, we've got our lights and materials, which we graphed into our geometry branch. Shader-wise, I am mixing the color map from Gaia with a little bit of noise. I use a different noise to randomly rotate the UVs, which I plug into a texture for displacement, which I've got disabled in the IPR for speed. I've got a second material for the inside subset, which is just using the rest attribute as the position input for a triplanar texture. Nothing crazy here. There are very basic separate shaders for the dust and debris, but we won't be covering those now. The last tips I've got for this are that I like to use a render geometry settings node to dial down the dicing a bit, as the default setting is sometimes too brutal for my home machine to handle. You can completely disable it by setting it to zero, which is great when you're setting up shaders. Lastly, I always use an LPE tag node and standard render vars to split my lights up into separate passes for comp. And that's it for now. I hope there is enough information in this video to start implementing RBD upres techniques yourself. There are several other elements in this project file that I didn't have time to cover here. If you are still curious about this or would like to take a deeper look at these techniques, the hip file is available on Gumroad. Link in the description. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one.